You guys know that the scripture tells us, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Paul speaks about us not looking at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things that are uh, seen are only temporary, and the things which are not seen are eternal. <clears throat> um, I don't think... Uh, anyone would really have any difficulty in realizing when the Hebrew writer in chapter 12 starts to speak about what we have not come to which in verse 18 was the mountain, the physical mountain Mount Sinai Christians don't head to Mount Sinai in Arabia that mountain that could be touched that burned with fire and blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them, for they could not endure what was commanded, even so much as a beast touched the mountain, shall be stoned or shot through with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that even Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling. He said, you haven't come to that. Man, what an experience that would have been. Tangible, solid as this here, podium. Well, then what have, what have we come to? Well, you've come to Mount Zion, city of the living God, heavenly Jerusalem, an innumerable company of angels to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who is registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, etc. See that don't, you don't refuse him who speaks, for if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on the earth, much more, much more, more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. His voice then shook the earth, but now he's promising, well, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, quote, yet once more indicates the removal of those things which are being shaken as the things that are made, the temporary things, that the things which, the physical things, which cannot be th shaken, the spiritual may remain. Therefore, seeing we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Now you well know that is all in the realm of faith. It's not something you get in your car, you drive to this place. You go to this Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, with all the innumerable company of angels and the general assembly church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You go there by faith, or you don't go there at all. But according to that context, not according to me, but that context, which is greater? The mountain that could be touched, that burned? The physical one, or... The one that you go to by faith. In the, in the physical sense, the intangible. Well, it's pretty obvious. He's making the point, driving it home. Our God is a consuming fire. <clears throat> we need to, uh, uh, since we're receiving this spiritual kingdom, which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. It's very clear that the spiritual side of the street is greater. That's the point I'm trying to make. Now, because we walk by faith and not by sight, back there in 2 Corinthians 5, some people consciously, unconsciously, immediately breathe a sigh of relief. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, no problem. Yeah, we're in the faith-based system here, man, uh, we don't have to go to some mountain quaking and shaking. We don't have to face giants and draw swords and take up wooden crosses. Ours is all in the realm of faith. Whether consciously or unconsciously, you see, let me make a point here. Brother Jay Wilson made a big deal out of this idea of worship and service. <coughs> Now, for many people, that's a boring subject because you've got to wrap your head around it a little bit. And I've heard people even say to them, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? So what? You know, worship to God is what it's all about. It is a big deal. 
And a lot of people don't understand. They think when they go to church on Sunday, they're worshiping. This is where it takes place. Between 10 and noon on the marquee out front. Come into worship, leave to serve, or some catchy little phrase like that. Totally unbiblical idea. Jesus made it real clear in John 4, talking to the woman at the well, worship isn't in Mount Gerizim, and it's not in Jerusalem anymore. Jesus said the hour is coming, and now is. True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. It's not in a place. It's in a relationship. It's 24-7. Okay, what is it really? Matt Hartford came here, did a great lesson teaching us, showing us worship in the English just doesn't give you the picture. It's submission. And when you think about it, that makes sense. We submit to God. That's why the prostration, always in the Old Testament and in the time of Jesus, when it says a person run up to Jesus and worshipped him, it meant they threw themselves down, submitted to him. Great picture. We're spiritually submitted to God. When? On Sunday morning, 10 to noon, or in my case, 10 to 12, 20. If Johnny's up here... 12 o'clock. <laughs> you see, that submission just doesn't take place in a couple hours on Sunday morning. And you might say, yeah, that, like, we get that, we get that. But, let, but again, let me finish what I was trying to bring out, whether consciously or unconsciously. You see, if people think they're worshiping at, at, at 10 to noon, that means they come in that door... They put their worship hat on, and when they go out the door, they take it off and put their secular hat on. You see, they have broken up their lives consciously, unconsciously, and they're sacred and they're secular. Now, is that a big deal? Well, here's the hot tip, pilgrims. If you actually think you've put that secular hat back on when you go out because you've got to go to work on Monday... Look, you're going to act out in accordance with your mind set. If your mind is set on things above, you'll act like your mind is set on things above. If your mind is set to the earth because you're at work, and with your worldly co-workers or wherever you go between Sunday evening and next Sunday morning where your heart is at where your mind is at you see our performance is going to reveal it now what I want to bring out we walk by faith but it is supported by tangible evidence it's not just all exercise in our minds it takes place there but the outcomes the outcome are going to be tangible. It's going to be your performance that everybody can see. They don't need special glasses to see, wow, I think you're in the spirit, man. You know, some weird purple 3D jobs or something. You don't need special glasses to see whether somebody's in the spirit or not. The world can see it. You know, I kind of quoted this morning a few minutes ago where uh, Jesus said, you're the light of the world. He said, a city that's on a hill can't be hidden. So what's he say to do? He said, let your light so shine that men would see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father who is in heaven, Matthew 5 and 16. Tangible evidence. They can see it. Well, guess what? If they can see it, hopefully you can see it. You know, the Bible tells us who can know the spirit of the man that's in him except the spirit of the man that's in him. Who can know the spirit of the man except the spirit of the man that's in him? I guess that's a better quote. And that, of course, is uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 2.11. 2.11. Now, one of the things, powerful things of the Old Testament I'm going to go kind of quickly because you guys know these things. Uh, but, you know, another thing that's uh, I think has been mentioned, whether you guys know it all or not or not completely aware of it, 
I know I need to slow down, give more verses, and turn to them, whatever, because you're not the only one listening to these messages. I have people tell me they watch our stuff. You know what I mean? They go out on the Internet. Not live. We're not live. But it's always posted. So we got to we, we gotta have a bigger realization of the impact that's being made, like the thermometer up there. It's not what's being done here as with always with God's uh, working. God's working all kinds of things all over the world, and you would be surprised to think about how maybe we've been impacted by others and we've impacted others. Now, that's not just to draw attention to ourselves. That's to draw attention to God. God is glorified. That's the whole, man, it's awesome to think of what you're a part of, whether you know it or not. Whether we just got to have a bigger picture of what's going on. So people can hear these lessons, and they do, uh, and they're encouraged by them. So we, we do need to make sure that uh, sometimes it may be redundant to some of you guys that have heard certain things for years and years and years, but there are sometimes people that are just now coming in to hear us because of what others have told them and other congregations. Well, listen to this church here. They got good messages because uh, they listen to all of the speakers that come up here. It's not just me. Obviously, I'll be somewhere else for a few weeks, but the word will be preached. Now, the book of Numbers is what tells us that God's people were to be broken down, separate, numbered as armies. Verse 2, and for Numbers 1, verse 2, take census of all congregation of children of Israel, by their families, by their fathers, houses, according to the number of names, every male individually from 20 years old and above. All who are able to go to war in Israel, you and Aaron shall number them by their what? Armies. And if you run on down and look at all the tribes, they were huge. Reuben, verse 20, every male was numbered, 20 years old and above, was able to go to war. The number of the tribe of Reuben, it says in 21, was 46,500. Then the next one, Simeon, there in verse 22. They were numbered, if you look there in verse 23, at 59,300. Those of the tribe of Gad, in verse 25, were 45,650. Now, you can read all of them. The grand total was 603,550 that were numbered all 20 years and above who were able to go to war. Hey, you know, war, crucifixion, all kinds of things like that in the Bible make people uncomfortable. I like those things. Look, I can't show any scripture that gives any evidence that any one of us volunteered to come down here and do this thing. The only volunteer I know who set aside his privileges and came down here to do this thing was one Jesus of Nazareth. For sure, he set aside his privileges and came down here. The rest of us, I don't know about that. I know our eyes opened one day and we were here. And here we go. Well, it's the scripture that opens up what we were created for and what's our eternal purpose. Next thing you know, we find out we just been drafted. <laughs> we're, we're, actually, we get enlisted. Uh, we have to enlist in this you, opportunity to be in the army of the living God. They technically maybe were more drafted. Uh, we enlist. We're uh, free will here. Uh, well, you know what God told them? They were going to go, if you look at Deuteronomy 7, uh, they were going to go on into a, being delivered from Egypt. They were to go possess a land, flowing milk and honey. Now, this land was occupied... Uh, by these nations, the Hittite, the Gergesite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusite, seven nations, that's right there in Deuteronomy 7 and 1, seven nations that were what? Greater and mightier than they were. Now, they were to go and conquer these people. You know that. Okay. And what happens? Well, in Numbers chapter 13, they rebel. 
They don't think they can do it. They, said, they specifically said, we're not able to do it. So in Numbers chapter 13, they spy out the land. They come back. They say in verse 27, uh, tell Moses, the land where you sent us, we went there. If It does. It truly flows with milk and honey. And here's some fruit. They brought back some evidence of it. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified, very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak. Okay, uh, verse 30, Caleb's trying to calm the people down before Moses. He said, let us go up at once and take possession. We're well able to overcome it. But the men who'd gone up with him said, we're not able to go up against this people, for they are stronger than we are. Now, they've missed out on everything God had been telling them up to that point. In fact, he tells them in Deuteronomy 20, uh, I guess I'll give that real quick. When you go out, he said, to face these people, uh, battle against your enemies, Deuteronomy 20, verse 1, and you see the horses, the chariots, the people more numerous than you, don't be afraid of them, for the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. It's so it shall be that when you are on the verge of the battle, the priest shall approach and speak to the people, and he shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. Do not let your heart faint. Do not be afraid. Do not tremble or be terrified because of them, for the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. They forgot all that stuff. They rebel. They don't go. They're cursed instead to die, wander around circles until they die. Do they get their new life? No. No. Had to wait 40 years. Joshua and Caleb believed they could do it. And Joshua would lead the people. 40 years later. Under Joshua's direct leadership, they had great success. <clears throat> they had great success. Uh, in Joshua chapter 11, Joshua Jesus too, by the way, make that connection. That's not coincidence. That's deliberate on purpose. Yeshua, Jesus. Uh, and Joshua 11. <clears throat> Verse 18 says, Joshua made war a long time with those kings. I'm, gonna, I'm going fast. I'm jumping. Because they had a lot of successes. Under Joshua's direct leadership, there was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel except the Hivites. That was the Gibeonite deception that you read earlier. All the others they took in battle. It was the Lord who hardened the hearts, their hearts, that they should come against Israel to battle, that he might destroy them, that they might receive no mercy, but that he might destroy them as the Lord had commanded Moses. Now, think about it this way. I'm trying to make these parallels uh, this morning, tangible evidence of certain things going on. Know this, this shadow of the Old Testament, the taking that land and defeating the giants and the enemies is us, moving forward, fighting the good fight of faith to subdue our old man, our old nature. Now notice what God, he just says right here. He got them people to fight against Joshua by hardening their hearts. Your old man is not going to surrender. He ain't going to run. If these people had any sense at all and realized what was behind them, they'd be running for their lives. God don't want them to run away. He wants Yahshua to kill them. He wants them dead. Hey, if you just want them to clear out the land, man, just so you can move in, he could have sent them bees like he did sometimes, and they'd take them hornets, and they took off. If God just wanted to clear the land, he could do it. But where are them people going to go? They're going to sit on the edge and come back and get you anyway later. <clears throat> you think they're going to just let you have it? God hardened their hearts so they'd stay and fight so they could be killed. Our old man ain't going anywhere. And he ain't going to give up. <clears throat> he has to be killed. So Joshua took the whole land, verse 23 said, according to all that the Lord had said to Moses. Now you'll notice context we're going to see. It, this was the initial conquest. 
there was still much land to yet be taken. And that's another point we'll be making. Joshua took the whole land according to all the Lord had said to Moses. Joshua gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to their divisions by their tribes. The land rested from war. Jump all the way across the page over to chapter 13 in my Bible, chapter 13. Now it says, Joshua was old, advanced in years, and the Lord said, You're old, advanced in years, there remains very much land yet to be possessed. They still had to keep moving and keep growing and keep dividing the land. Remember what God told them earlier. I'm not going to let you take this place in one year. It'll become vacant and the wild animals will take it over. Now look, that's our mind. He's talking about our mind, brother. When the evil spirit go out of a man that goes in dry places seeking rest, Jesus said, and finding none, said, I know what I'll do. I'll go back and once I come, he comes back and finds that place swept and put in order, moves in with other seven other demons, uh, worse than the first. Uh, that condition of that man uh, now is worse than the first because <clears throat> he found it empty. You can't just dump your mind out and not put nothing in there. It's a purge. And that's the same way he told me you take the land. You won't be able to do it in a year. Now, one of the verses I was going to show you that uh, Caleb, uh, oh, Joshua 14, let me see here. Joshua told, uh, uh, sorry, Caleb told Joshua, verse 7, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea, Go spy out the land. Him and Joshua, they all went. He said, I was 40. And Moses promised him that he would receive a blessing and inheritance. Uh, and now behold, verse 10, he said, the Lord has kept me alive. He said these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now here I am this day. I'm 85 years old. Yet as str I am as strong this day as I was on the day when Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so my strength is uh, for war, both for going out and for coming in. I'm 85. I want my inheritance. Do some math. He's 40, he said, when he's sent, they wandered for 40, now he's 85. Uh, you can draw some conclusions. This battle is not something they did in a few weeks. Looking at five years. And that's the initial conquest. It wouldn't be done for a period of time even yet. Now what ends up happening is Israel begins to let it slip away. Slip away. I'll just pick a spot. Uh, I'm in chapter 15 of Joshua, verse 63. For the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Judah couldn't drive them out. Couldn't drive them out. <clears throat> 1610, they did not drive out the Canaanite who dwell in Gezer. The Canaanites dwell among the Ephraimites to this day and become forced laborers. God said, don't make them slaves. You kill them. Do not make them slaves. Don't try to control this rebellious old man. He'll take you in the long run. He must be destroyed. He must be killed. Uh, Joshua has to come to him in verse 18, or sorry, chapter 18, verse 3. Then Joshua said to the children of Israel, How long will you neglect to go possess the land which the Lord your God your Father had given you? What are you waiting for? See, he's, he's stepping back. These people are supposed to be going. Oh, but they start making all kinds of excuses. Chapter 17, verse 12, The children of Manasseh couldn't drive out the inhabitants of those cities because the Canaanites were determined, determined to dwell in the land. They were, were they? I'll tell you what, your old man's determined too. He ain't going anywhere. But verse 14 says, The children of Joseph spoke to Joshua, saying, Why have you only given us one lot and one share to inherit, since we are a great people? Inasmuch as the Lord has blessed us till now, Joshua answered them, Well, if you are a great people, then go up to the forest country, clear a place for yourself in the land of the Perizzites, of the giants, and the mountains of Ephraim are too confined for you. But the children of Joseph said, The mountain country is not enough for us, and all the Canaanites who dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron. 
both those who are in Beth Shean and in its towns and those that are in the valley of Jezreel. Joshua spoke to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, saying, You are a great people. You have great power. You shall not only have one lot, but if the mountain country too, too, uh, mountain country shall be yours, although it's wooded, you shall cut it down to the further extent. It shall be yours, for you shall drive out the Canaanites, though they have iron chariots and are strong. Look at the difference in the mindset. These people are trying to make excuses. They deserve more. We, you, we deserve, we're a great people. You need to give us more. He said, no, get up there, go take it. Well, we can't. Well, yes, you can. You notice this little back and forth. Who's failing? Who's, who's, who's seeing themselves as, uh, we be not able? You get to the book of Judges. I'm jumping ahead here. Judges 1, verse 19, the Lord was with Judah. They drove out the mountaineers, but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the lowland. Why? Because they had chariots of iron. Does that make any sense to you? <laughs> Easy. Easy. The Lord was with Judah. That's a good thing. They drove out the mountaineers. That's a good thing. But they could not drive out the inhabitants of the lowland because they had chariots of iron. Say what? Where was God? Probably over there watching, waiting for them to have the faith to go do what he told them to do in the first place. You know what that tells me? God's going to go about as far in this thing with us as we're willing to go. When, it, when God has already told you, look, don't be afraid, don't be frightened, don't not be dismayed, despair, whatever you want to call it, I'm with you. And if you still look at those mountains, those giants, those walled cities, and say, we'd be not able, we're grasshoppers. These are powerful, powerful faith builders. They're supposed to be anyway. Uh, <clears throat> could not drive them out. Could not drive. How long will you neglect? I told you as I opened up, war or crucifixion, that are not pleasant thoughts. We didn't sign up to be here, but we're here. And I just lost a dear sister in Christ, as far as I'm, Jamie knows, Sue knows. I mean, whoever's been to Belarus, I'm scanning real quick here. Galina Yashnikov. She is the first Belarusian that I met 26 years ago. When the bus pulled up, Stuart has some old rusty bus and pulled up to this house. A woman came out, and he said, Steve, J. Wilson, Larry Jackson, Walter Brewer, you're, you're at this house. Galena took us in and fixed us lunch. They gave us their flat for the two weeks. They stayed at Victor's parents. And I've known Galena for all these years, and she died two days ago of heart problems. And, you know, it's bittersweet. That precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his saints. Our hope is in the Lord. Our hope is not here. But the idea of the passing of time, I can see pictures of me and Galena, and believe it or not, my hair is darker than it is now. <laughs> I look like a young guy. Now I look like an old guy. And Galena was 78. I don't know, she must have been, I don't know, 50 when I met her. But anyway, she, she's gone the way of all the earth. So we have to deal with these concepts of who we really are in the Lord. Now, 1 Timothy 6, I'm New Testament now. We've got a few minutes. We'll do a little New Testament. In 1 Timothy 6, you know, the Apostle Paul says, verse 12, Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold of eternal life. Get a grip on it. Lay hold to it. Pursue righteousness, he says in verse 11. Godliness, faith, love, patience, action, Jackson. Stuff to do. Don't be deceived. What God said, do not, God will not be mocked. What we sow is what we reap. Make our calling and election sure, Peter says. We're constantly being admonished to... Make it real. Well, there should be tangible results in this journey of faith that we are about. In 2 Timothy, 
He says in chapter 2, verse 3, You therefore must endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Soldiers? Soldiers? How about Galatians 6? You know what? I probably won't even read the whole thing. Sorry. Ephesians 6. The other Galatians. Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, and put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the, uh, against the wiles of the devil, for we're not fighting flesh and blood or wrestling with flesh and blood, but against principality, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, a, a spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. And he describes this armor that we need to put on. I don't know how some people can read that, that just think Christianity is about going to church on Sunday when you worship for two hours on Sunday morning. What the heck you need all that armor on to go to church? Because it's not about that at all. I do, I, you know, I want a real, realistic expectation. What is going on around here? And if the shadows show me a slaughter of all these people, and we've shared this before and you guys know, and we did make the comparison earlier in the message when we compared Hebrews 12, about the physical, the mountain, the shaking, and the quaking, and then the Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and blah, 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 which is greater. Obviously, the spiritual side is way greater. <coughs> there is no way they had the tougher fight. No way. That means we've got the tougher fight. But man, the minute we think about it, and think about it in the realm of faith, in the intangibles, we think of it as intangibles. We breathe a sigh of relief. Woo, man! I'm glad I'm not back there and have to do what they did. You better rethink that. They had the easier way. We have to make ours real by faith. We really have to really take a look at what's being said. I told you guys this before. After that passion flick came out, I saw a thing on the news one time, some local theaters, and some people were coming out, some girls were crying, you know. Man, I didn't know he suffered so much. It's in the Bible. Oh, it's in the Bible. It says, and they crucified him. And they crucified him. See, it's in the Bible. But that doesn't bring all that angst and anguish into your mind. It says in the Psalms 22, they pierced his hands and his feet. And we know they did because Jesus, after he resurrected, showed them, like Thomas said, except I stick my finger in a hole in his hands and thrust my hand into his side. So it says it. It's in the Bible. But you know what? We don't make it real. Because it's in the realm of faith. Yowzers. But when somebody puts it in technicolor with surround sound, man, it scares the daylights out of us what happened. You see, we have to make this real. There needs to be evidence. Tangible evidence. We're told to be that we need to be soldiers, good soldiers of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul would say at the end of, of uh, at his uh, life, in uh, my, my pages are falling apart here. I get excited, then I, I rip them right in half if I'm not careful. He says in 2 Timothy 4, I'm already being poured out, verse 6. The time of my departure is at hand. I have what? Fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. He did it. He went through it. And man, we don't have time to unpackage the things that guy suffered. Like the Lord said, he is a chosen vessel for me. And he will suffer many things for my sake. You see, a lot of people don't realize the kingdom is now. A lot of people think that Jesus is going to come back and establish a kingdom on the earth and reign here for 1,000 years. I have heard and read where some of these false preachers and, and so-called professed Christian dumb, because they don't believe Jesus established the kingdom, all that stuff in the Sermon on the Mount, 
You've heard it said, but I say to you. You've heard it said, but I say to you. They say, man, that's kingdom teaching. That's kingdom teaching. I say, amen, brother, but I know what I mean, and I know what they mean because they say so. Because he didn't bring in the kingdom yet. All those things where he says, and I say to you, turn the cheek, give up your coat, go the second mile, don't be looking and lusting. They said, that, that'll be when he, the, the millennial reign. In other words, it's not in effect even right now. You don't have to go the second mile right now. Isn't that good news? If somebody say, hey, man, you know, let's go. Say, hey, man, heck with you, you do it. Somebody take your coat and uh, take it back. They smack you in the face, hook them in the eye. <laughs> because, see, that's kingdom teaching. Kingdom ain't here yet. Well, what part are you supposed to pay any attention to then? They said, well, you know, the Lord, he, because the Jews rejected him is what they say, that Jesus said, ah, forget it. And he went back to heaven and ushered in the church age of which they say the scriptures are silent. Then what good is any of this? What are we doing here? That's right. Because these people don't understand the church is the kingdom. So the church age is the kingdom age. They don't want to hear it. All that persecution, taking up the cross, put on the armor of God. I've had people tell me the devil is in, he's gone. He's in the lake of fire. There's no devil. No devil. Well, then what relevance is any of this to me? Part of it, he hasn't come back to fulfill to get it started. The other part that I'm being threatened and warned against, the whole first hour studies that we're all doing down here, rip it out and throw it away. It's done. It was done uh, 2,000 years ago. All that's history. It doesn't make any sense. If there ain't no devil, then there's no beast. Then there's no false prophet. And who the heck is Babylon? That just affected them. And tangible evidence. Look, the only way you have any tangible evidence that you've been forgiven and have received the gift of the Holy Spirit is because of what the Bible calls the fruit of the Spirit. It's the outcomes, as I said earlier, a few minutes ago when we started. You know because of the outcomes. A fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, gentle, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. It's evidence. Now, Paul said, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith or not. Don't you know your own selves how the Christ Jesus be in you, except you be reprobate? Do you think those people knew whether or not they defeated the, the Amorite or the Hittite? Well, of course they knew. They knew they did not because they had enslaved them. They're looking at them. Is that what God told them to do? No. What did they do? They didn't obey God. They, they still had the evidence of the existence of these people all around them. What did they do when confronted by it, about it? By Joshua. Argued with him and made excuses of why they couldn't do it. So for sure they knew they didn't do it. Look, you and I both know whether or not we are presenting in our lives with what is called the fruit of the Spirit or the works of the flesh. Don't you know, Paul said, your own selves, how that Christ Jesus is in you? Why does he say that? Because that's your power to, to get rid of that garbage. It's by the power of Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, there is tangible evidence for faith that takes place in the mind. And it's because of the outcomes. We can measure it. And if it's not there, we need to go back and figure out why. Why the fruit of the Spirit is not manifesting. Uh, and what do we say about the works, the things manifesting in our flesh that are still there? And we know they're still there. We can see it. Maybe not everybody. Maybe certain things are only taking place in, in, the, in the realm of uh, in our minds. But don't make the mistake either. Don't just look at the things that you know don't belong there no more and be all oh, just looking at that. Don't forget the other side of that coin is the righteousness. The, the, uh, to do the, 
the good things. Jesus did both. He, he abstained from doing the evil things, but he did the good things. We don't just say be warmed and filled. We do what is necessary. There's action. There's tangible evidence that even the world can see. And if the world can see it, it must be obvious in both cases. They can tell whether or not <laughs> some people see some Christians and they think, yeah, don't give me any of that, man. <laughs> it ain't doing you much good. Uh, so the victory over the world, the faith that gives us the victory over the world is tangible. It is clearly seen. Uh, and it's the abundant new life for us. And the conformance into the very image of the Son of God, which is his character, is to be manifested, according to Second Corinthians uh, chapter 4, in our mortal bodies. These are tangible evidences uh, of where we're at. So just to be encouraging, that's, uh, don't think everything is just in the realm of faith. It's accompanied with the outcomes, and that's your proof. God bless you. I'll, Lord willing, see you in, on the sixth Sunday from now.